Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're gonna look at a viewer question that came in on our most recent crosstalk video, and this question relates to guard traces. So, do you use guard traces in your PCB to try and prevent crosstalk? Well, what we're gonna do in this video is we're gonna look at some simulations to see how well they actually work, and we're gonna review some simulation data from an earlier Altium Live video with Eric Bogatin. So make sure to hop into Altium Designer and follow along and let's get started. So before we get started with this demo and some simulations, let's take a look at that viewer question. Godzich writes, what about placing ground traces between signal traces? It would be nice to see a comparison to 3W or 4W cases. Naturally, these traces cannot be floating and they have to be stitched to an underlying ground plane and some intervals. Maybe another video about this variation? What Godzich is talking about in that question is guard traces. Guard traces are routed in between two traces that are carrying digital signals. And the idea is that placing some ground right in between those traces on the same layer is supposed to provide some protection against crosstalk. This is one of those methods that was created long ago and often cited as a method that is very effective at reducing crosstalk. But I think it's one of those points that you do need to simulate thoroughly in your particular stack up in order to check that it works properly. First, what we wanna do is take a look at an earlier Altium Live presentation from Eric Bogatin, because in one of these earlier Altium Live presentations, he actually simulated crosstalk between two traces when you have a guard trace present and when you have vias in that guard trace. Let's take a look. This is now the crosstalk on the poor victim line in these three cases. The red is the crosstalk on the victim line with no copper pore in between. So we're up to not 0.2%, uh, but we're up to about 0.35%. Uh, it's still 0.35%. It's a tiny amount. And here in blue is when we added those 11 nine or 10 or 11 vias shorting here. Yeah, it's a reduction, but not a whole lot. Now it's down to 0.25% instead of 0.35%. It's still a tiny amount. But look what happens when we add the copper pore and it floats. Now we have a short enough rise time so that there are frequency components in this edge that match the resonant frequency for this piece of floating metal that is a resonator. It's a cavity with the ground plane down below. And so look at its impact. We get all of these shark spikes and look, we only sent a single edge down, yet we left behind energy in this floating cavity that bounces back and forth. And every time it bounces back and forth, we get pollution over to our poor victim line. And look, we get this residual noise. The crosstalk dramatically increases. This is 1%. We get about you know 1.2, 1.3% as the crosstalk between them. Without the copper fill, we're down to 0.35%. And now with it, we're at 1.2, 1.3%. So there are a couple of important takeaways from that presentation. And I think the most important one is that if you do use a guard trace, you can reduce some crosstalk. However, you'll notice that from his results, the crosstalk was already very low. So you need to wonder, is it really worth adding a guard trace in order to reduce crosstalk? when you could just bring the ground plane closer to the traces and probably get the same effect. The other point that he brought up was the spacing of the vias if you do place vias along the guard trace. If the vias are not properly placed, you can actually create a resonance in those vias, which then couples very strongly over to the other trace. And then you get more crosstalk and not less crosstalk. So the spacing of vias is really important. And I bring this up a lot of times in the context of stitching vias and in terms of the shielding that can be provided by stitching vias. So now that we've looked at those points from Dr. Bogatin, let's see if we can reproduce some of those results in Altium Designer and in Symbior using the test board that we looked at in the earlier video. So I'm inside Altium Designer and I'm on our crosstalk test board that we used in the previous video. In this board, I'm looking at a couple of strip lines on layer three, and these strip lines are separated by 3W. And you can see here in the stack up, we have 10 mil dielectrics on the inner layer. And if we take a look at our impedance profile, we can see here that for the single-ended impedance, 
we have here about 8.3 mil wide traces. Those are the traces that we're using and we have 10 mil dielectric thickness. So what we wanna do is compare the case where we have just this pair of traces with another trace that is routed right in between them. And then we can check the crosstalk in each case. Already, we can just immediately go into the signal integrity dialog, do a quick analysis of the design, and we can select those two nets. And after we select those two nets, we just assign victim and aggressor. I'm gonna set the bottom one as the aggressor. We could also set the top one as the aggressor if we want. Hit that crosstalk waveform button and we can immediately get a value for the crosstalk in the time domain. Here, we can see that the crosstalk is already pretty small, even in this 3W case. So our benchmark for comparison right here is about negative 3.5 millivolts of near-end crosstalk. So this is the near-end crosstalk with no termination, and then we have some far-end crosstalk as well, going down to looks like about two millivolts. So now that we have these results, let's look at what happens if we then take a small trace and route it in between these. So first we need to place a via. I'm gonna place it right in between these two and we'll set it to just make it a through hole just for ease of routing. And we can copy this via over to the other end of the interconnect. The size of the via at the ends doesn't really matter because what we really care about in this simulation is the trace and not the via. Then once we have that place, we can go into our internal layer and then we can route this guard trace. So by default, you can see it's pretty thin. I'm just gonna make it a bit thicker and we're basically gonna have a 1W spacing between each of our signal traces and our guard trace. So after we add this in, we'll do a quick save and we'll go back into the signal integrity tool, reanalyze the design, and then we'll select those same nets and then let's see what happens here when we repeat this simulation with the same settings. So from the results, we see basically no effect from this simulation. And that's interesting, right? The two traces essentially are ignoring this guard trace if you pay attention to the results in Altium Designer. So the issue here is that the formula that's being used to calculate the crosstalk between these two traces is not considering the presence of a guard trace right in between them. So this is essentially the same thing that would happen if you were to use the signal integrity tool with copper pour around your traces. You have to remember that Altium Designer recognizes planes for ground and not necessarily other pieces of copper in the layout. So in order to understand the effect of this guard trace, what we need to do is actually take this into Symbior. And then once we simulate it in Symbior, we can really compare whether or not this guard trace is effective at reducing the crosstalk. Now I'm back in Symbior. I have my two traces here without the guard trace. And just from running the compliance conditions, we can actually see already that we need to increase our coupling distance in order to examine the crosstalk. So first things first, I need to set my threshold here to a lower value, and then we'll go ahead and run this ERC again. And under our proximity and model adjustments, we then need to set our coupling distance much higher. So these are separated by 3W, and W is an eight mil trace, so they're separated by greater than 20 mils. You can see here my coupling distance is limited to 20 mils. I'm just gonna beef this up to 100 mils, and then we'll build the linear model, and then we can extract it with a pulse excitation. In the time domain response, I'm gonna look at what happens with the pulse excitation. We wanna look at the pulse crosstalk, and then when we hit finish, we can see the results. So first, in the time domain, we can already see here that just by separating by 3W, we have under one millivolt pulse response. So that's pretty good. So our pulse response here gets up to about 0.6 millivolts, and that's with a one volt excitation. Our 0.6 millivolts with a one volt excitation dropped over a perfectly matched to reference impedance of 50 ohms input is actually a 500 millivolt input into the design. So we have 0.6 millivolts divided by 500, and that gives us 0.12% crosstalk. So that's pretty low. So the 3W rule has a lot of power here. When we just space out the traces, we can get pretty low crosstalk, as you can see here from this result. So next, let's look at the coupling between the two traces in the frequency domain. If we look at this in the frequency domain, we can then reassign these ports just by starting from the insertion loss plots. So I'm gonna take these plots, redefine these in terms of the different matrix elements, 
and then we'll rescale the graph. Then we can really see what the S parameters for crosstalk look like in the frequency domain. So this is what the crosstalk looks like in the frequency domain. So here we have the far end crosstalk and we have the near end crosstalk. And as you can see, our near end crosstalk is pretty low. I mean, we're almost down to negative 45 dB in some frequency ranges. Here, the far end crosstalk is extremely low, all the way down to negative 70 dB. So these are really good results for crosstalk. And again, it just illustrates spacing out your traces is one of the easiest ways to reduce crosstalk. What happens if we add in that guard trace? Well, to do that, I just go over here to import and I'm gonna import my other ODB++ files with the guard trace. So this is what it looks like with the guard trace. And as you can see here, we've got our grounded guard trace. I can select the other two traces around it, assign the ports properly, we'll go ahead and run this. Now already, just from this, you can see it's flagging crosstalk between these two traces. If we go over here to fast SI, make sure our coupling distance is set to a large enough distance, and we have our ERC threshold set low enough. We can now go ahead and do our linear network, and then we can extract the S parameters and the pulse response. So let's go ahead and build this, set up the pulse response, and let's take a look. This result tells us that just by adding in that guard trace, we do get a pretty good reduction in crosstalk. Before, we were at six times 10 to the negative four volts, and then here, we're at five times 10 to the negative five volts. So it looks like a factor 10 reduction just by putting that guard trace there. If we look in the S parameters, I just need to then change these matrix values. And after we change the matrix values, we can see how these curves have rescaled. We can then get the crosstalk in the frequency domain. So you can see here that we're getting a pretty significant reduction in crosstalk. Before, we had about negative 70 and negative 40. So here we have about negative 65 and negative 85. So significant reductions in crosstalk. So all of these results drive with each other. And it does show that by adding in that guard trace, if it's properly sized and then spaced to the other traces, you could get a reduction in crosstalk. However, I'd like to note that in this case, where we looked at the previous case with 3W spacing and no guard trace, our crosstalk is already extremely low. I mean, it's less than one millivolt. That's gonna be low enough for any high-speed signaling standard that you need to work with. Adding in the guard trace does reduce the crosstalk, but it's not really worth the extra effort to do that on all your high-speed traces. You can see here that the guard trace does give a pretty significant reduction, but you have to decide for yourself whether or not it's worth it to do that on every single trace in your design. It's essentially similar to placing coplanar ground in between your traces and then stitching that together everywhere with vias. The other point that I'd like to note here is that in order to even make room for that guard trace, you already had to have your traces spaced far enough apart to give you low crosstalk anyways. So this is another instance where you have to ask yourself, is it really worth it to route in that guard trace? And I think that's one of the points that Eric Bogatin was making in his video, is that adding in that guard trace in some cases can reduce crosstalk. It's not really worth the extra effort. So I'm gonna leave it up to you, the viewers, to decide whether or not it's worth it to include guard traces in your PCB. So if you do use guard traces, please let us know in the comments. And if you've done any tests with guard traces, definitely let us know in the comments because I'd be interested to see what you observe in actual measurements. Thanks for watching, everybody. Make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave your comments and questions in the comments section. And of course, let us know your experience working with guard traces and any other measures you know of to reduce crosstalk. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.